a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Welcome to the room, everybody. It's so great to see each and every one of you. We're so excited to be here with you this evening. Dr. Bricado and I uh, can't thank you enough for always coming and supporting uh, not only this channel, but for making that book in the number one position, The New Evil on Amazon. Right now it's down a notch, so we need to push it up tonight. <laughs> and get it over the hump again. We got to put it back up there. And, and, if this is your first time here, <laughs> if this is your first time here, welcome, welcome, welcome. We only ask is that you uh, hit that subscribe button and hit that thumb button and then send it around the world to all of your social media platforms. Uh, for that, we are always grateful. I got to tell you, it is so exciting tonight to have our lead mod, Miss Sophia, back with us uh, this evening. This is her first evening back, so let's show her some love in the chat here. We are so grateful that you're feeling better and that you're able to join us here. Um, we were worried about you, uh, but you were always in our prayers, and, and for you being here tonight. Uh, is a special, special treat because God is great. Now we'll decide who's going to win the game, the 49ers or the, the Lions. Uh, each of you can pray for your own individual teams and see if you get the same blessings that Miss Sophia had. Uh, with that also, Mimi J2, Maui Girl, Teresa M, all of you, we love you. You're our mods there. We're so grateful. Well, if you're also new to this channel, I want to introduce... Dr. Gary Bracato. He is a visiting scholar at Boston College, where he collaborates with Dr. Ann Burgess and Dr. Victor Petraka on forensic research. He studies, among other things, how violence, thoughts, and actions, actions emerge in psychotic versus non-psychotic persons. Dr. Bracato is the co-author of the Columbia University Mass Murder Database, which is the largest in the world, with hundreds of years of research. And he is the co-author of this book behind me, The New Evil, Understanding the Emergence of Modern Violent Crime. Uh, we're so grateful that he is always blessing our show by coming on and taking his time to be not only with us, but with you. So let's show him some love. But welcome, uh, Gary. Welcome back. Thank you. It's always a joy to be here. I'll tell you. Uh, if you've not read this book, put your seatbelts on. It's it's a great, great read. Uh, it's intense. We will tell you that, but we'll walk away with it with a tremendous amount of knowledge. I uh, had a great weekend. I uh, went to a nice wedding in San Diego for my old partner's son. Uh, it was great to see all those folks, and so love to those guys. Uh, and then I got sick uh, throughout the week, so I was going to come on uh, a little earlier in the week, but that didn't happen. And whoever did that uh, to me, I'm going to hunt them down <laughs> and find out. It wasn't that bad, but it was enough to knock me down. All right, so tonight, let's go through the lineup. What are we going to talk about? Uh, tonight's lineup. Well, there's a whole bunch that happened uh, recently here. BT, or BK was back in his court hearing. 
uh, we're, I'm going to sh- we're going to show you a video of the house uh, when it came down, but we're going to there's another twist to that particular problem, uh, as well as new information the family has revealed in uh, BK's case. Uh, we're also going to go to the back of the house uh, and we're going to talk about why that place is so significant, not only from an investigative point, but from a psychological point. And then, of course, uh, I'm also going to show you a clip where Dr. Bricado recently was on Court TV, uh, and he gave a really fascinating answer uh, about the two surviving roommates, as well as BK. And we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to go jump over to Gilgo Beach. Uh, We've got some really interesting things to uh, chat it up there. Uh, So we've got a whole bunch of things going on tonight. Uh, and uh, we hope you can stick with us. Uh, if you've got questions, please put them into the, um, you know, the chat over there. And, and at some point, pr- you know, typically towards the end, uh, we'll grab it and we will put it up. So uh, that said, whoops, I just hit the wrong button. I want to remove that. So let's uh, let me give everybody a little update real fast on the hearing uh, that took place. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, accused killer Brian Koberger, of course, and and the latest developments with the Long Island serial killer case, which I just talked about. But before we get there, let's always remember the reason why we're even talking about any of these two individuals, uh, because they're they've allegedly committed horrendous murders, and both of them. And so who's the most important for this channel is not those two individuals. Uh, They're presumed innocent uh, until proven guilty by a court of law. However, the most important individuals are all the victims. And, of course, that means Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, and Ethan, and all of the victims in the Gilgo Beach homicides, and and probably many, many more that haven't come to the surface yet in Gilgo Beach. So at the hearing this week, a couple of interesting things happened. Uh, at the hearing in Latah County, Judge John Judge, why don't you like to go through life as Judge Judge? I mean, that that, that in and of itself is, a, is kind of a tongue twister. So on Friday, a, a couple of things were brought up, and the judge uh, denied the defense's motion to dismiss Uh, BK's indictment once again. So that's number two, two strikes. Uh, The date of the trial was discussed. The prosecution wanted a summer 24 trial. uh, And given the reasons that the summer is when the high school next to the courthouse is on summer break. What the heck that has to do with anything is beyond me. Uh, But this is one of the reasons that they wanted to push the prosecution wanted to push for a 24 trial. Uh, University of Idaho is out. Hotel rooms are more readily available, uh, as if people, you know, needed hotel rooms. And uh, I thought the community, you know, could do just fine. Uh, traffic on campus would be light uh, for summer break. These were actually the arguments of the prosecution: high school, hotel rooms, and light traffic on campus. That was the argument uh, for the prosecution. The defense came back and said, well, you know what? There are a ton of terabytes of data, and there's that's just too much information to go through, and we want a trial in the summer of 2025. Uh, the prosecution said, well, the earliest they would then be able to be ready, uh, if they can't do it you know, soon, would also agree to go to the summer of 2025. They kept saying that they only wanted to try the case once. That makes that that is a very interesting con, uh, statement, Gary. I mean, if a prosecution stood up and said, "Your Honor, we only want to try the case once," uh, what does that mean? Right. No, it's it's interesting. I yeah, mean, I don't want to read into it too much, but it's interesting. It it is interesting for sure. They kept saying. Uh, Bill Thompson told the court he did not want undue interruptions that could cause issues with the community's perception of the trial. What the heck does that mean? You know, he doesn't want undue interruptions 
that could cause issues with the community's perception of the trial. Uh, that is a really strange statement. I mean, I've been in a lot of courtrooms, and you know what I do during the day, uh, Gary, and I, I, I'm in courtrooms all the time, uh, all day, many days of the week. And I've never heard that one. That, that was a first for me, too. And then, strangely, right after that, the judge, Judge Judge, brings up that, you know what, let's, let's possibly change the venue. So the judge introduces the idea of a venue change. And then he says, I'm not, you know, I'm not arguing about changing the venue. Uh, and then the prosecution, Thompson, jumps up and says, well, this spring, he was at an association meeting in McCall, Idaho. And there was more news on this case from Boise on this case than we see up here. So he was arguing that even if we change it, it's not going to make a big deal. Uh, of difference because there's a lot of things going on outside of this community. And he also adds, I have friends in the community who've traveled to Mexico and they ask, are you from Moscow? And immediately they want to talk about the case. Uh, so it's not Moscow. It's Leita, it's Leita County. It's everywhere. So basically what Thompson was saying uh, from my interpretation of listening to that was it doesn't matter if we move it. Even if we move out of this area, people are going to know this case. Well, well, that's logical. That is very logical. However, if you're com if you're worried about the community perception in your first concept uh, and presentation to the court, then perhaps you should move it out of there, and that way you get another community that some people may not know. You know what's going on there. So I don't think a change of venue is going to solve any of these problems. Uh, personally, uh, but I do believe maybe that was a good idea to bring up and discuss. G Gary, what do you, what's your thought on that? You know, I think that I can understand these concerns. I just think a sort of fascinating little paradox and is that a person with the apparent personality type of Koberger would want the whole world to know him and be talking about him, and then you wind up with that being a problem uh, for the venue. Uh, which is sort of, you know, you can't get a place where people aren't talking about you or don't know everything about you. It's sort of funny because, I mean, as a result of what you've done, the, you know, how on earth do you think you're going to find any place like that? Which, of course, feeds the ego of a person who says, wow, imagine that there isn't one crevice where they aren't saying the name of, you know, you know, so it's sort of interesting to me. That happened with Gacy, by the way. Uh, they had to move the venue because it, he was just too infamous. The story was so infamous it wasn't possible to get a bunch of jurors together who didn't know every single thing about it. It was too sensational. And I'm sure he loved that. Yeah, no, isn't that interesting though in today's world with mm -hmm. the technology advances that we have and how fast information can travel. Uh, oh. I don't I don't know if, you know, I don't know if there they would uh you know, find a place that hadn't heard of this. But he, he, here he goes on to say, uh, the, the case should be held here. It's it's a Latah County case. We believe that we can select an appropriate panel of jurors from this county. We have the tools to work with that. We have a fairly comprehensive draft, draft questionnaire to send out so the court can assess the level of knowledge of the potential jury pool. Uh, and then so the judge said, okay, well, let me consider that uh, however, he did not set a date for a trial. He says, I'm not going to let it hang too long, though. Uh, and I think a lot of people kind of went, you know, well, what does that mean? Uh, and I don't think we know. Uh, and then, you know, of course, he took into consideration the families uh, and how they were feeling because they desperately, you know, like uh, Kaylee's family desperately wants a trial and they want to they want to get this thing moving. But one interesting comment the judge made at the end of the hearing, uh, and he said uh, he would not make a date, uh, would not make a decision on the date of the trial on Friday. This is what he said. I have empathy for the victims, though. And, you know, that in of itself could be a problem. Uh, it is a judge's job to represent Lady Justice. The scales of justice, they're balanced. That means she wears a blindfold 
Okay, just like the just like the statue, probably in their courtroom. And when you say stuff like that as a judge, you're you may be projecting that your empathy is leaning one way or another. When the first admonition he's going to give in a jury in a jury rule will be Brian Koberger's innocent, and you must presume he is innocent until he is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and the state of Idaho has that burden. It is not Brian Koberger's burden. And so by him projecting forward empathy towards one particular side, I get the fact personally that we are human beings, and yes, empathy is a great tool, but his responsibility, and I'll quote it, is judge. That means he has to be in the middle. He is to judge the evidence as it's presented correctly for the jury, i.e. correct any law problems within that evidence if it's presented inappropriately or if it's even appropriate to come into the courtroom. And that means he has to represent, unfortunately, not only Brian Koberger's interests, but Brian Koberger's family and the other family victims the of our four victims here they are they are important but it is the public's perception of the four victims and the suspects that we have empathy for it is not the judge's position in my opinion that could come back to bite him in an appellate uh hearing that said let's talk a little bit about new information um that's, that came out that I saw about the house coming down. And this is a uh, news report um, in relationship to while the house was going down. And what's interesting is a member of the college was there and was fielding all of the questions in relationship to the house coming down, which again goes towards, in my opinion, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. The book, you know, the chapter in the book, you know, leadership during crisis, et cetera. The decision was already made, in my opinion, within a week, two weeks, that that house was coming down. This home where four University of Idaho students were brutally murdered is now an empty lot. We just didn't feel that it was the best decision for the children. It was just over a year ago when prosecutors say Brian Koberger, a criminology graduate student at a nearby college in Washington State, snuck into the rental home in the early morning and proceeded to stab Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. So one of the, one of the things that uh, I want to point out here uh, is, you know, the idea that you the courts can't have empathy. Okay. <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize always that I have, I've had a lot of empathy for a lot of my victims' families, a tremendous amount. But I cannot get emotionally tied up in that empathy. My job is to be responsible to not only the suspect and their families, but the victim and their families. And in this particular case, when you have a university making decisions about removing evidence, when you have judges saying, I have empathy, but then only mentions one side of the equation, okay, that, that is usually a sign of, we haven't done this a lot. And the defense will jump all over it. And if anybody watched the defense's uh, position recently, uh, in this last hearing, I got to tell you, they were they're on their A game. They are on their A game. In fact, they they to the point started to argue where you know they they're going through all their stuff, and the prosecution's just kind of sitting there. And so it's going to be interesting. And then you hear that statement, and then you watch this the one. Home turned crime scene clearly visible from campus was given to U of I. And school officials say tearing down the house 
was necessary for closure. This is a next step toward healing for our community. We have not made it a secret since the time that the house was given to us that our intent was to demolish the house. Okay, that's all you need to hear. Uh, the 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 intent was to get the healing to the community and to tear the house down. That's no secret. She just said it from the university. Now, what about the four victims? It, and by the way, this is off campus, but what about Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan? Because this also now has come out. This morning, Kaylee Gonzalez's parents sharing exclusively with GMA never before seen pictures and videos of their 21 year old daughter. This is a type of, you can like season with these, you can't really season with them, but you can cook with them. Yeah, I know that's in front of the tower. Yeah. This is at the, in front of the University of Idaho Tower. Mm -hmm. The family still waiting on a full digital copy of Kaylee's phone from authorities. These are the Sunday. last moments of your child's life, and you're sitting here fighting with somebody who just doesn't care. Okay, so let's stop there for a second. This is the father of, you know, a victim. This is the father. And he's saying, we're fighting with people that do not care. Now, what does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? Because, Gary, help us understand the psychology of Brian Koberger once again. Let, let's go back to when you uh, first gave the assessment uh, of who this guy would have been. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, we now know somebody that fits that, you know, that persona. But what does it mean when you have a victim's family who is saying, look, now that the house is torn down, now that this, and he, and he shows pictures of his daughter to remind the world, this is, my, this is my daughter. This is my victim. This is me. It, this is my blood. And you have a university saying, well, it's no secret that we were going to tear this down from the very beginning. How is Brian Koberger reading this, do you think, when he's watching all this Michigan? Um, well, you know, um, I have in my career been surrounded by many people who would be termed scientists. I am technically a scientist myself, uh, having done many years of research and uh, being a social scientist. And scientists are an interesting lot because in meticulously studying something and knowing everything about it and coming to feel that you could predict the future of what something is going to do in a reliable way, you start to get a little bit of an, of an ego because you start to forget that, you know, just because you could predict this one little element of the, of the world of the universe doesn't mean, you know, everything. Uh, but what starts to happen to some of these people is they start to think that they've got the whole world down to a whole series of little tidy formulas and, predictable things and, and so forth, then you can become very proud. It's very easy for people like that to think they've got it all figured out. What happens with people like that is, is that they sometimes aren't very good with people and people can bedevil them by being unpredictable and impossible to submit to, to that kind of scientific rigor. And what I think is you have to understand that if you're a person who has tried to reduce everything to a predictable science because you're kind of a robotic wrote meticulous kind of person and then you're you're trying to interact with people and they just don't like you you're weird right you come across as weird and you can't make a science out of them what you're going to try to do is study them meticulously so that you can you can figure out how to relate to them so you already start to get some of those features in a stalker type of a person right who's going to study you and i do believe that if Koberger is guilty he studied the intended target like an insect or a, 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 a something in a petri dish uh feeling like a, a god looking through a microscope or like a scientist whatever but i think that he was studying everything from TikTok videos to the you know where the windows were located in the home you know the kind of food they ate when they left the house where their cars were etc but I also think that that type of person has this kind of colossal ego where ultimately they cannot accept that the thing that is wrong with the experiment is them, that they are introducing the problem. They are odd. They are not. 
And so with this kind of person, what you would get is an ego that sort of inflates and defra deflates like a bag, right? Then the more people talk about him and the more people think he's powerful and in control, that bag would inflate. And if something made him feel bad about himself, it would shrink and he would need to gas it back up. And I think that for this kind of person, cruelty, condescension, feeling smarter than other people was a way of gassing himself back up, right? And um, so if you understand that, that this is about ego and, and, and rendering everything a science, then the idea is that you'd be a master manipulator. You would manipulate people through a kind of a science to get them to do the things that gas your ego back up. Like we see in the, inf in the incident where he's talking to the female officer about driving rules and gets himself out of a ticket, right? So yeah, I, ha I have a clip of you on court TV about yeah, that too. Well, that's the other sure. stuff, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think the idea is you have a person who's got that mixture of I'm a scientist, I got it all figured out, but people are a little annoying, and as a consequence, I only know how to manipulate them through cruelty, and then you know, taking their adulation when it comes. It's back and forth, and so if you're that kind of character, if I'm right about that then everything that hurt the people that he perceives as rejecting him would be a victory to that ego, right? And everything would be manipulated like by a puppet master. And that's why when you talk about how brilliant the, the defense is and so forth, I, I can't help but wonder how much he's calling shots with them. I picture him calling them in and saying, you know what you should point out? Pop, 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 pop. I never right. consider that. Yeah, right. that's that's exactly the kind of personality he seems to have, and he knows a little bit about the law. And I could picture him saying, "No, no, no, don't go, don't go with that. Go with this. That'd have a better effect." There are studies that show that juries are more, you know, so that that you got a picture that even there the ego would probably be playing out. And then you know when people come on TV and say, "Oh, what a brilliant defense," he's probably sitting there going. I think he probably manipulates everything and uh, everything is for effect, the way he's dressed, the little smirks, the, the, the appearance, the whole thing. And I think that, that that's all about reducing people to a predictable science. That's the whole idea. Right. And of course it works because there are, you know, half the country thinks he's some kind of fascinating creature. There are people madly in love with him. You know, it's a, it, he has that way. Right. And then he wants, a place where they don't know who he is, which is funny to me. So, so I think the answer is that everything that happens, the house being torn down, the parents being upset on TV, etc. It, it, if he is the kind of person that he may be innocent until proven guilty, but if he is the kind of person who committed this offense, he'd be laughing up his sleeve a little bit that all of that happened. Because, of course, he'd want the house torn down. It's a gigantic piece of evidence. Watching it torn down would feel like you know, I win. And and then and the family getting even more hurt and those people becoming more invisible and their voices being buried. All of it would contribute to that feeling of I win. And and I and that's what bothers me about it. It's the insult to injury, the adding of insult to injury by colluding with the colossal ego of the person who committed this offense. So let let and then so let listen to what dad says about the daughters, his daughter, and being trapped in that room. And then I'm, I'm curious as to what you think, you know, his fantasy and just all of this emotion that, you know, he had been building, building, building up to that you've talked about on numerous times. But, but listen to this and tell me what you think uh, was going on in his head, because we know the brutality of what he did to collect some of Kaylee's belongings from the university over the summer, which raised concerns for them about how well possible evidence was processed, including a trash can from Kaylee's room that was full and appeared untouched. We opened it. It was a little um, squeezy applesauce thing that you would give to like a toddler. Yeah. It did not appear to have been gone through. Police saying they had gathered more than 100 pieces of physical evidence from the scene, along with some 4,000 photos and 3D scans of the residents. Still, frustration mounting for the family over what they consider a lack of communication and a rush to tear down the home on King Road. Christy describes for the first time how Kaylee was found. It's my understanding Kaylee was kind of sitting up yes. and had fought. Yeah. And the way that, that room's 
put together, if you come through that door, you can't get out of that room. Completely, totally trapped. Yeah. You're tiny, in a bed. Tiny, tiny room. The bed, the, the bed was the, the entire room. You could barely open up the door without swiping the, the foot of the bed. And it was wall, wall. You know, the headboard was up against the wall. The side where Kaylee was on was up against the wall. And if you can imagine Kaylee in an upright sort of position, up in the corner, slumped. I mean, she was trapped. What do you think's going on in his head, knowing that he's got him? Well, if he's guilty, this is the kind of person who, rather than focusing on the goofy mistakes that he made, would be like if he could watch that video, would be pointing out all kinds of things that procedurally were silly or done wrong. Like, for example, uh, Chris, I'm sure you noticed that the people handling the evidence boxes were gloveless. Yeah. They were walking around with their bare hands carrying the. Now, who knows how those things were packaged? Hopefully, with gloves. I don't know. Maybe someone inside had gloves and boxed them, and then these people were just lifting. But we don't know. There are things like that I could see somebody pointing out critically who understands a crime scene or at least has studied them and to some degree. But I think also, you know, that 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 there's something about that that narrative of um, framing it that there was a fight and all of that. I could see that really bothering him if he was hearing that story. He probably would almost feel an urgency to leap into the the screen and say, "There was no fight." I, there was no chance. What are you kidding? You know, because I think that 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 narrative um, doesn't jive with the way that this person would want to would want you to see that that the event occurred. Um, you know, but it's also interesting, Chris. Are we going to get into a little bit about why that that day was chosen? Not only that house, but that day. That, that in other words, why that night? Are well, we let's talk about that a little bit. I've been very interested in that question, and and. Um, I know that the the media has picked up on the idea that there was this sort of proximal event. If Koberger is guilty, there was this sort of getting in trouble at school, complaints about him. In other words, we know, Chris, you and I know that with offenders, both serial killers and mass and spree murderers, you there tends to be a personality that's or an emotional issue that's brewing, and then you need a, a proximal event that sets the match, right? So we always ask about that. Like if Ann were here or Greg Cooper and Burgess or Greg Cooper, they would be asking about probably about that proximal incident that sets the fire. And I think that probably some slight like that or feeling out of control or losing the mechanism by which he was feeling powerful, particularly over women, it sounded like, because he was grading them harsher, it sounded like. That may have figured into it. He also had a birthday that was coming up that may have had a significance um uh, uh uh you know uh, very, just a matter of days um uh vis-a-vis -vis the, the the date of the crime it's also interesting to think about that there was snowfall and the moon the lighting right because he needed lighting we don't know if he went in there with some kind of bulb or you know device but or if there was illumination i know uh, dr burgess and burgess has asked about this the just incidentally uh, the day and the, the of the murders um, there was a waning gibbous, which has a illumination of about 77%. But um, as Science Magazine pointed out five years ago, there is an increased illumination when the moon is shining on snow. Snow has a way of brightening. There's a sort of strange effect where it brightens things. Remember Clement Seymour, who wrote the, the it was the night before Christmas, there's a line that says, and the moon on the crest of the new fallen snow gave an ob uh, gave a luster of midday to objects below, right? So, the, so the, the idea of that when the moon hits the snow, it brightens everything, like it's like you know. And I think there would have been a sort of certain amount of illumination that would have been necessary coming through that window that would have helped. Um, but, but, but so because I think when we think about it, we're picturing him in like a dark room, not knowing what's going on, getting thrashed at, and he's thrashing and the whole thing. But I'm not so sure it wasn't a little illuminated. So like one of the things I want to know, and again, you know, we don't have a model in front of us or whatever, but it, there, is there a window that looks out into that? And where is the moon relative to that window? Well, it would have been uh, to the right of the, the, the um, wall. And there was a lot of different uh, buildings there, as well as the trees 
behind the house. So I think looking into the back of the house, uh, you had some exterior porch lights on. So you had a lot of illumination there. You had lights on inside of the house. Lights were still on uh, when the when the PD was there. But, but but was the snow already there, or did it come after the? It, it had started. It, it was off and on. It was off and on. But there was snow on yeah. the ground. There was some snow okay. on the ground. I, I not not a ton. Not exactly. a ton. There. Okay. Yeah. So so in other words, it is plausible that illumination figured into the. It's possible. Of, of yeah. Because because the way I'm picturing this is that this is a scientifically minded person. This is plotted. This is not a. This is not a person who flipped out jumped in the car, went there and did this. This is this was a fantasy that was methodically plotted, I'm sure. In fact, I was asked about that on Court TV. I have this not a doubt in my mind that it was methodically plotted. And uh, and and I guess the question is why that day? Did it have to do with the idea that he thought that he wasn't going to, you know, be in school soon and it needed to happen before going home and he wanted to, you know, have an escape to go home? Uh, did you know, did it have to do with um, you know, the fact that there was certain illusion, illumination, did his birthday trigger it? Did it, was it what happened at school? In other words, I'm curious what your thoughts are, Chris, on why then, why that day? What, what was the, why did the fantasy become reality that day? You know, that I, there's the trigger point, right? What we're talking about, what, what was the, the situation that, that pushed it over the edge? And to be honest with you, I don't have that answer right now for, for me. I don't I mean, think anyone has it. That's yeah. what's bothering him. Did he know, for example, from surveillance that supposedly the person he wanted to target was going to be there alone? But then it all got botched because, you know, he probably had to turn off whatever surveillance he was using to go there and the people showed up or were awake that weren't supposed to be. So right. I'm sort of wondering if you think that he had that date, the killer had that date in mind a long time. Or if it was sort of like, I have a fantasy and now I've got to choose the perfect day and time to do it. We know from plotters like of the type that would have committed this crime right. that that date would have had a highly strategic quality to it. There has to be a reason. And yeah, you can it based on surveillance and knowledge of the of the victims. Yeah, Kaylee was leaving, right? She got, she got a job offer in Texas. Right. But we don't, uh, unless he was into... You know, remember we talked about this most recently in one of those, in the affidavit, one of the search warrants, there's an intrusion expert uh, into their into their networks with inside of the house. So the question that I think you and I have both had, and, and we've bounced it off a variety of other people, is was this guy sitting in the back uh, constantly and was he surveilling? Did he have some type of surveillance method uh, into the house? Okay, and if so... What was that surveillance method? It looks like they pulled her, you know, laptop. And so you people that know, uh, you know, you can hack a laptop and you can be on their camera uh, without their knowledge unless you look down and see the light. And he, and, was, he was gifted, Chris. At he was time. gifted. He, In fact, remember, he wanted to go to the PD and train the cops in that area on how to, you know, how to do this stuff. But let, let me take you back to the backyard real fast. When Karen and I were up there, uh, and by the way, this is this was 11 days after the murder, so the scene is still secured. Uh, the cops are still there. They're still working this uh, event at the time. And my question, you know, was which which was the route that this guy was going to? And I had concluded that day that he came up and that he had probably gone around that building and went behind where the victim's house was, which started me to think, uh, you know, okay, wow, we've got a voyeur here. Uh, and to the point where, you know, I, I would have called you, <laughs> you know, if we, if we were working this, I would have said, Hey doc, this is what we got. And by the way, you've got to get over here and take a look at this backyard. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it, to me, it just spoke volumes of the personality of this individual. And so let's watch this together and you'll see after uh, the event. This is 11 days later, so let's m be mindful that there is a lot of snow on the ground on this day, and it, it, I don't know if there was any, if not a little snow on the date of the homicides. So let's, uh, but there was definitely, it was freezing cold. Around the main 1122. 
No, I did this on Thanksgiving oh, Day. This is 11 the, days the after streets murders. Where the Uber would have turned or the friend who drove them home. Um, it's, it's a friend, apparently, and they've not released that individual's name. But this is the area. Uh, and you're going to see this kind of goes up and it dead ends. Mm. Okay. That's important to understand. There's the house. And, and on that house, they clock. The, the house is about two o'clock now. It's on the right. But we're gonna, I'm going to take you up to the... Okay, I'm just going to say one thing real fast. Not being critical, but being investigative critical. Look at the tape. It's hanging down off the ground. The cars are still there. This is 11 days later. And anybody in Homicide 101 knows if you have cars on that via in, in that crime scene, because that whole street is a crime scene, I mean, right around where all that tape is. Everything within that crime scene should have been photographed, packaged, and or secured immediately, especially outside. Uh, so everyone, in, the, in my opinion, if I was the case agent on this case, I would have said, why are these cars here? Get them out of here get them into a secure facility so we can process them later. Okay. That was not done. That was the first thing I noticed coming up that street and which caused me to think, okay, what else do we've got going here? And that was also one of the reasons uh, I started looking for stuff and lo and behold, they discovered that glove sitting behind this trash can here. Apartment oh. complex here and on the other side. And it's important to point out all of this is off campus housing. You see this apartment complex here on the right. I'm sure you've seen it on the news many times. And all the other homes around um, 1122 King Street um, is all students. It's all student housing. They're private homes, but obviously they're rented out to the students. So this is the building that everybody is playing the video on showing the the white car coming around with the illuminated lights at night. So that's the building where those cameras are. Now, wanna... one thing here is if I were to keep going to the right, it will take me around to a parking lot that is behind 1122. Okay. So if I go to the right, it takes me behind the house, the target house. What I wanted to do is show you here to the left, this is ice, okay? And I'm in a four-wheel drive truck, so I come in and I actually have to put into a four-wheel drive to back out. So the weather that day is significant, especially uh, at 3 o'clock to 6 a.m. Uh, in fact, it was um, icy fog, and I believe it was in the 20s. So that's significant in understanding not only the victimology and catching the type of clothing uh, the victims are wearing, the girls, but also understanding what the suspect might be wearing and why that's so significant. And so I want to make sure everybody's on you know target there. It's cold right there. But, uh, Chris, 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 where, is the, where is the house? relative to what is in front of us right now okay so if i were to keep going to the right i would go around that building we just passed okay and that and that would park me right at kaylee's window literally literally i'm going to show you here uh in a second it's gonna i'm going to take you right around. i'm not gonna take you around the building i'm going to come back and park but then i'm going to walk up and you're going to be able to get a I, I, I'll tell you, Chris, that one of the things I am most eager to get my hands on one day is um, if Koberger is guilty, is his electronic data, his um, search histories and things like that. And one of the things I'm dying to see, because I, as a mystery for me through this whole case, has been, was this university selected for schooling because he had already identified the victim through social media and become obsessed and moved to be near them? 
or did he go to the school and encounter the person who was nearby? That question has never been answered. And I'll tell you why the electronic things mattered, because one of the things I'm dying to find out is, did was he looking like, for example, on Google Earth and virtually visiting that house well before ever, well before even being out there? Would you be shocked, Chris, if it turned out that he was using Google Earth to drive those streets and see where that house was and so forth? I and mean, it's one of the things that's horrifying about Google Earth. Is it, she it, is it her, on. What? What is that? Oh. <laughs> I'm joking. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. But, right. I, I can't. But, yeah. but would you would you would you be um would you be surprised by that? No, not at all. I think it would be yeah. Right. I mean, I think it's going to be on par with him. If well, he's got, that, if, if he's got that technology background, why not put it to use if he's going to go out this far uh, in terms of these four homicides? Right. But, but I guess what I'm saying is, what if we find out? Because I'm dying to find out if there's an electronic trace that he was looking at that house many, many months before he was even out there. Well, you so, and I you have know. thought that you've thought that for a I while. And I, I, I'm leaning toward that. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and Tara is saying here that there may be something I'm saying that, that was covered in court documents that I don't know. I'm not sure what that's referring to. I'd be interested to know. Uh, the, the point here is to be accurate, right? Um, but but my understanding is that we don't know if the, if the victim was pre-selected through social media because it would be totally par for the course with this kind of person to become obsessed with somebody that they had found on social media, use electronic means to find out where the post came from, where the person was located, et cetera, and to know in a weirdly intimate way everything about them, and then to want to be near them. And, you know, and it may simply be that the forensic program, you know, that was nearest was the one that was in Washington. It is also entirely possible that this was a chance encounter with the victim. There was this fixation, that scientific prop process I told you about of wanting to reduce the person that you have feelings for or an interest in uh, that you're drawn to, uh, to a kind of bug, you know, in a box that you're studying uh, or, or whatever. And then ultimately, um, you know, to commit this crime as a way of completely possessing them. So I, I really want to know that. And I think the electronics are going to tell us. And I think a lot of the electronics are going to be surveillance and they're going to be uh, photos and things that were lifted from social media. I also think, Chris, and I'm going to give a watered down family show version of what I had said to you earlier, is I know from other offenders that sometimes they'll use the images that they take off of social media as part of a fantasy. So the the image might be like the face might be lifted off of an image and placed on a pornographic picture or a deep fake might be made for sexual reasons or whatever. Um, so we don't know how imagery would have been used, but we know that for these kind of offenders, that is an extremely important part of the thing. I mean, these are highly visual people to the point of almost being predatory hunters that think like a like the way an animal would think about positions, visual, spatial, things like that, right? If I drive here, this will happen, etc. So highly, highly visual. Now, um, but Chris, just um, do you have do you have footage that shows going around that property into the? Yeah, right here. Can, uh, this is right see where some out. of the cars were parked, where the snow, yeah. uh, Hyde Street. Remember, if I would have gone around that building, I would have come down this side street. And so, one of the things I wanted to understand, what from a you know investigator position is what did the suspect see mm -hmm. and what w would the individual have been um thinking um right in this particular case at the time there were all, all kinds of cars parked along the right side of that road right there that is an icy road going up that road even the day we were there with the sun out so now go back to the evening uh, where it was, you know, 28, 29 degrees or whatever it was, it was below freezing. Uh, that road would have been icy or at least snowy because if we look at some of the uh, early photographs, uh, you can see the line of cars that are there. 
and then simultaneously also recognize uh, the amount of snow. Okay. Honey, any thoughts on this while we go up the road here? Um, no, let's just play it a little bit more so they can, you know, get a better perspective. By the way, that building to the left, there is a light up there, but it wasn't working the night of the homicides. It was broken. So this would have been pitch black. And, you know, I think people love your intensity, Gary. They love watching you you're, because they can tell your mind is going. I love watching you. I, 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 I love watching you. You're, you know, <laughs> it's fascinating where, where you go because, you know, it's it's interesting, but it, so we go up this uh, hill. So here. I'm actually looking for a solid place to walk so I don't slip. But I have to be honest with you; those cars sitting out there bothered me. It, it, it I mean, a lot of folks can say, you know, well, you know, blah blah blah. No, there's no excuse for that. There is no excuse for that. None. That's why they have tow trucks. And that's why law enforcement area, you know, departments have facilities that they process, process these vehicles. Who's to say that BK, if he is our suspect, did not walk out of that house and look into any one of these cars? And you could have his fingerprints or maybe blood or a transfer of blood on those cars. Just ask O.J. Simpson. Wow. O.J. Simpson had blood, uh, Nicole Simpson's blood on the handle of his vehicle. Now, he was found not guilty, but the fact that you'd have to go to another planet to find that blood of, of Nicole Simpson, who's to say there wasn't any blood that would have been available and or fingerprints or anything to that effect, and the longer you leave it out into the elements, that evidence now becomes, you know, degradable. It, it start, every single day, it starts going backwards, starts going backwards. And any experienced investigator should have known, put these cars on a tow truck and get them out of here. And then they could have processed not only what's on the car, but what's under the car. Right. Maybe I, 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 I don't think it figured in here, Chris, but there are cases, I'm sure you know of cases too, I have heard of where the offender who is knowledgeable about crime selects an area because the, the the law enforcement in the area it would be like their first rodeo to handle that kind of offense that in other words you don't do it in a place where the law enforcement has seen a lot of serial killing or mass murder or whatever it has to be like the keystone cops like the whole idea being that that you know they're, they're just not going to know how to handle it and remember that for somebody like Koberger, if he is guilty would think about that because remember that everything is about superiority so the key would be, I would know better than they do. You've got to go to some place where they're not going to do a very good, you know, well, I mean, we can't criticize the job they did. I mean, in many ways, it was a good job. But I guess what I'm saying is you would certainly pick on, you You would pick a place potentially where the people that would be responsible for always seeing it would have less experience. And that is something somebody like this would think about, wouldn't you say? I think so. Yeah. And he may have. Because comes to come to find out, the lead investigator only had two years experience on the job and not a single homicide, zero. In fact, if you go back seven years, anybody that worked for that department for seven years had never worked a murder. Absolutely zero. And that morning, they're looking at four dead people in that house. They should have gone time out. I need ISP. I need the FBI evidence response team. I need everybody and their mother. And yes, they showed up. ISP showed up. But how did they show up? They showed up as volunteers outside of the forensic team to comfort the feelings oh, right. of the, of the uh, university. In fact, in the book, Mr. Green puts in the book, I thought it was really exciting to see a video go viral of our students and Idaho State Police sledding together. Well, meanwhile, back at the ranch, right? 
Yeah, you know, you know, Chris. Somebody and made it's kind of deceiving. Those of you made a point in the in the um, chat that they hope that the victims' cars were checked for any kind of tracking devices. Well, and that's again, that's why you impound them immediately. And, you, and comment. I hadn't thought of well, it. I'm sure they have. Would have been, but but uh, but because Chris, remember, didn't he try to volunteer to like work for law enforcement on uh, yes. with electronic surveillance? So that tells you that that is something that gave him a sense of superiority that he thought he could, could knew better than the police, literally that he knew better than the police. So that's sort of a clue, a giveaway. That, that that's the way he would express superiority in the offense. So that, that it's going to be along electronic lines that he would try to commit. It reminds me of, um, of um, a plumber's rocket in Victorian times when you wanted to find where the crack was in a pipe. You would put a, a smoke bomb inside of it that made red smoke. And then you would watch where the smoke came through the crack. And then you'd know where the hole was. Yeah. It's like that. You could smoke out. <laughs> how are you going to solve this crime, this offense? That Because the clue is given by the way that the individual tried to express superiority prior to the offense. So I think it's going to be along electronic lines that he's going to have tried to express superiority and tripped himself up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and so, but but I think time will tell. But it's I'm telling you, those electronics are going to be huge. I think the electronics are going to be hu huge. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. am a little, you yeah. know, being... I'm trying to be an optimist, but I'm also, you know, trying to think outside of the box. Like, how is how is the defense thinking right now? So I'm trying to think outside the box, and that, you know, that from an investigative, you know, uh, perspective, that's usually the best way to go because then you can cut that off as yeah. soon as you, you know, as soon as you get to it. But it, what's really weird because in the Chad Daybell case, oh. they called the FBI's evidence team to come process that scene and they and they nailed it they nailed it and in this case they called ISP as the primary forensics team uh and then they they called the FBI back later and most of the agents the field agents that came there uh did all did interviews they did field interviews canvassing uh that type of stuff but the the most important piece of this puzzle was the FBI, the the you know the evidence response group. They should have been there from day one on that scene, especially with a department like this that didn't have the experience. And, and I'm not I'm not being, you know, I'm trying to not be critical, but at the same time, I'm trying to be realistic to these four victims here. They they deserved. And they deserve the families of each of these victims and Brian Koberger's family, believe it or not, deserve professional work, 1,000%. And, and, and when you see this... Who and live you, around oh, ice and yeah. snow, even underneath those leaves, it's slippery. Now, one thing I want to bring your attention to real fast is you see this crime scene tape to the right. Notice it splits off. Okay. There's a reason for that. Either one, they expanded the crime scene, or two, they narrowed the crime scene into some type of physical evidence around the front of that building. So my in initial thought was walking up there is the approach to this building to the rear and to the side around to the front because you'll notice that tape and we're going to go a little bit closer to that when we get to the back but that was the first thing that caught my attention walking up this hill chris i if 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 i were there i would probably weird everybody out by walking off the scene of the house because what i would be interested in looking for is his perch there yep. were traces of of this offender somewhere where he would put himself to watch and i have seen everything under the sun in how people leave their traces bundy uh, for example was found many decades after um killing to have left his initials in a tree uh in in, in one of his little spots 
uh, you know, you never know how, how people do that. But I think that you would find little clues that a person had been perching there. You know, the grass is disturbed. The, you know, it's an area where the twig is broken. I mean, wouldn't you go looking for something like that? Absolutely. And in fact, listen, listen to what I say here. Um, and but you've got a fair amount of woods, trees back there. And we talk I talked to the owner of this car right there. Oh. And he told me that he backs it in purposely because it gets so icy in that area back there that he pointed out some of the other cars, and you'll see it here in a couple seconds, that other students pull in, but they have a heck of a time trying to get out when it's icy and they start sliding uh, down that hill. And so I asked him, you know, what brought him to that thought process? He says, well, I back it up into this position uh, so that I can just pull straight out. And I said, well, that's interesting that you're thinking ahead. And he said, yeah, my father is a, a, no, um, is a homicide, retired homicide detective. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And we chatted it up a little bit. And um, uh, he shared with me some insight uh, in reference to the neighborhood and a variety of other things, but uh, he was a very well-mannered uh, young man who was going to school there, and he was pretty shaken up as well. He was sleeping that night, and like everybody else around there, a lot of them woke up to the uh, commotion taking place. Now, mind you, again, this is 11 days. This is the top parking lot, and the tape just goes to the end of the um, tree line here. So we're gonna do a deeper dive here in a couple of minutes because I think this area here, you'll see the, how the other cars are forward, is really important to understand from my perspective. And this was this was the area where the, the car is seen. Now we don't know if that car is connected to this crime or not. A lot of speculation on it. It could be. It's come. It comes around. It comes around that you know that. Remember where I went on the front, Gary, and then I turned to the right. If you were to keep going around, this is where it comes out at the top of this hill here, back there, where that furthest car is. You can come around that this driveway, and it brings you right into the back of Kaylee's bedroom, right there, right where that tree is. Yeah, so this is a three-level, you know, a, a three-level home. And so I see one comment in there about investigators looking out of the home to see what type of line of sight. Uh, that would be uh, very important uh, because of some things. And, and I'm going to point out a couple other things here for you. Obviously, if there is a voyeur of any way, shape, or form in this geographic region, then that line of sight becomes very significant. Tell tell everybody why that's so important, Doc. Well, because there is no question that whoever committed this offense would be like the many people before who have committed offenses of this type and likely had uh, a tendency to engage in, in a kind of stalking behavior that would have a voyeuristic quality uh, well before the offense. It's a process of surveillance. It's a uh, it's associated with a godlike feeling that you're, that person doesn't know they're being watched. It reduces the person to an object that is being studied. Uh, it makes the person uh, completely vulnerable without their knowledge. It's a, you know, but in addition, it, it, it becomes a way of uh, kind of expressing domination and control over people. And so we want to know where this stalking happened. It probably would have been partially electronic given the suspect's background and it would have been partially going to the house and finding a, a place to sit or go and so any place that gives us a clear view into the house is important incidentally chris when you point when you said the thing about the three-story house um doesn't it jump out at you based on other offenses you've looked at that that's an extremely high risk house to go yeah. into and I don't agree. you think that a lot of this, what you're showing us from a, like, I remember this came up with the Summer Wells case. There, there's something about this setup that has a high risk quality to it. 
choose where it's located and the way the roads are and all of that. This is a high risk offense, wouldn't you say? Very much so. And if we look at this background here, Mm -hmm. and the more we look at it, right? I mean, I wish you could have been there with me. It's it's not in a way. (laughs) I know you did later, and you nailed it later. But this was you know the day. But that hill is not very steep. It's really easy just to walk right between these two trees, for an example, right yeah. down there, and you're into the slider, into the kitchen of that house. Or if you go down and you turn to the right, you're into the bedrooms on on that second level. But if you stayed up at the top perch here, you're at eye level with with uh, Kaylee's room. I mean, you're, you're just sitting there, and down underneath, you know, right. it... it it was eerie. It was eerie at the time, you know, to see this in terms of actually be there. That's why you need the house. <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess this is one of the reasons why, and I mean, you can diagnose me later, but I, I figured, what are they doing? Right. Why are they tearing this house down? What in the world are they doing? There's the patio right there. Right. That's the back patio. Right. And remember, and- Remember that that Koberger, if he's guilty, I think is the type of person who would who would study something and then want to immerse himself in it to feel it himself. This is a person who, for example, was studying what people feel when they kill. If he killed, part of the interest would be what actually happens when you do it. And, you know, so that that's the kind of person who would precisely the kind of person who would understand that you wouldn't want to get rid of the actual house because you would need the sensory experience to immerse yourself into it. And now it's gone. And that kind of person would say, well, that, that's good. Now you don't have the capacity to put all five senses <laughs> to work in that place to, to fully experience it, which somebody like that would understand is necessary for proper detection, right? I mean, a true detective doesn't just look. They smell, they touch, they, et cetera. You need all the senses to detect. And, yep. um, and, and that's a problem. I, I agree a hundred percent. So this is, there's, there's her room and, and look at, I'm standing, right. T- filming this. I'm standing. I'm, I'm probably what 35 feet away from the house. If that, yeah. and you know, you put on a, you know, some binoculars or you put something, you know, whatever. And now you, you know, you're actually in that house. You're in, you're in there. You're in the room. But what I would have done, Chris, if I were there with you, is I would have said, if we could go into the house, I would say to you, I want you to go up to that bedroom window and I'm going to go to this place that would make a handy perch. Yep. I want you to tell me if you can see me and I'm going to tell what I can see and would I need binoculars or a telescope or something like that. And and I want you to, you know, in other words, and then we would look at night, et cetera. We would have to put ourselves into it because my guess is that wherever this viewing place was, it had to be something where, you know, you're dressed in darkness, in dark clothing, and you're perfectly quiet and you just blend. And, you know, and and, and so there has to be some trace. If that happened, there's got to be something there. So I hope that the entire area was totally dissected looking for that. But I suspect that you don't think it was. No, because I was there when they just started to search outside. Mm. I was actually there. Mm. And and I, again, I shook my head and I didn't, and I haven't said anything. I'm not saying, you know, as much as I, I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic, you know, I really am. And then, and this is one of the reasons why I thought the critical piece of this is not only what's inside, but that house in of itself is just so important. And it I get the fact that it ran against the grain of, you know, the university's perception. I get that. I understand it. We all understand it. I mean, you do, Gary, more than anybody. I mean, how many people have you worked with in criminals that say, you know, I can't believe they did that, to be honest with you, because it helped me. And so it kind of blew me away. Now, I, I want to shift gears for a second and go, and by the way, if anybody wants to watch the totality of that video, you can go uh, see it. It's, it's, I put it up in the top 
play position. Actually, uh, it's fascinating, Chris, because it's allowing us to envision what the killer would have seen moving up the roads. Right. And, you know, for an astute person, it's something of a treasure trove. Uh, you know what I mean? Because it's all these little things you don't think of, right? It, it's like Sherlock Holmes said, there's nothing more important than trifles. The, all those little details matter. And being able to immerse yourself is really interesting. That's the first time I'm really able to picture what he would, if he's the killer, what he would have been seeing from that Elantra, you know, making his way up the road, you know. And um, so I'm fascinated by that. I really, really think it's cool. Yeah, by the way, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I also think um, it's interesting to think if he knew where the surveillance cameras were. Yeah, I don't know, right? I mean, it, it's it, it it. I think he's he had done his homework. If well, if Brian Goldberg's our guy, and you nailed the, you you know you've said this a dozen times, um, but so let's talk about the other two girls just briefly. I mean, being sensitive, obviously, to the fact that. You know, look, there's a gap here in time when the 911 call comes in. And I know you recently appeared on um, Court TV. Can I play that clip? Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say something very quickly before yeah. the thought leaves my head. Um, yeah. When I am asked to think about what might have gone on at a crime scene, one of the first things I do is I try to look at it through the perspective of the estimated intellect level of the suspect. If a person is highly intelligent, there's a very different way you would think about what you would do than if the person was not particularly bright or average in intellect. And with a highly intelligent person, I don't think this is some kind of genius, but he certainly would be at least a little above average. I mean, you know, because he had obviously uh, gotten his ego from some years of you know people telling him he was bright uh and uh you know and he and but but i think not a genius but smart i suppose and and he, he prided himself on it. and so what i think is we have to look at this through the lens of a smart guy who's trying to out outwit everybody now wouldn't a person like that pick a perch that was away from where you know the cameras to be so so the, so the first thing that you would do is you would look for the perch somewhere that is out of the sight of the camera. So you, if you made a list of all the possible locations, the first thing I would do is X out anywhere that was within the path of those cameras. Then through process of elimination, you check the places that are out of the line of sight because this is a smart, this is not an idiot. And, and then, you know, of course he made goofy mistakes and I'll explain in the context of what you just asked me why I think that happened because it ties to that point. Um, but I think we have to look at it that um, he would have probably been aware of where the cameras were. So I'm going to play this clip, uh, kind of set it up for us. You were on uh, with uh, Vinny Politon and you were talking. They were the, the segment was about the two witnesses, what they may or may not have seen. And uh, just the face is the way she describes it. Gary Brucata, what are your thoughts about? why she may have been spared here. Well, it's important to emphasize that we're entering into the realm of total speculation here. But we should remember that if Koberger is the culprit, he had described online um, being someone who experienced states of dissociation, that under intense emotional stress, he would sort of blip out of reality uh, a little bit, zone out. I have suspected that it was dissociation under the stress of that evening that led to leaving the sheath and probably led to the zoned out walking out of the house. Uh, I now, now, oops, I just hit the wrong button. Intense, sorry, sorry. Uh, kind of break that down a little bit more for the uh, average bear out here. Excuse me. There you go. Sorry. Uh, Koberger, you know, again, if he's guilty, uh, Koberger had had posted on the internet in a kind of cry for help, I suppose, uh, some time ago, um, about his various pathologies, things that were starting to happen to him psychologically, consistent with the profile that was created of a knife, you know, a, a knife mass murder. This is somebody who, you know, I think he knew what he was doing if he was guilty. He, I mean, he wasn't not guilty by reason of saying, of course, that's obvious. Nobody thinks that very premeditated, organized, et cetera. But he was troubled 
most people who commit mass murder with a knife are are troubled in some way and he was uh and um i know that sounds silly but i, I you know because of course they're troubled what i mean is there's something emotionally authentically going on there it's not just their personality right and we know that that this is somebody who described depression anxiety isolation visual snow you know this kind of soup of symptoms but one of the interesting things is he talks about dissociation, looking at himself in the mirror and seeing himself kind of turning into meat, feeling that the world around him was sort of fake, that the, the people that he was looking at weren't real people, a kind of a Truman Show phenomenon in a way, right? And so that this this is a mixture of what we call this um, depersonalization and derealization. Derealization is where the world doesn't feel real. Depersonalization being when you just don't feel like you're real or you're yourself or whatever. And um, what happens is that for some people under emotional stress, when they're out of control, which is probably the reason people like this live such a mechanical road existence to avoid anxiety. When they're under stress, they get very disorganized and they can have these dissociative blips where they kind of zone out and, and and in those moments they can really make goofy mistakes or do things you know that are a little not planned let's put it that way this is not to say this is somebody who did not have control over himself if he's guilty but it does mean that he probably under stress would have blipped out and what i think is we have to picture that this was a night that probably did not go as planned it was supposed to be an assertion of control and instead was totally not as planned right so you got to picture somebody sweating and adrenaline is pumping and all this kind of thing right and, and he's probably having to kill people that are there just because they're unfortunately i mean i hate this phrase but sort of collateral damage right when he's targeting a particular person the fantasy isn't going as planned and in that soup this is the kind of person who would probably blip out dissociate a little bit you know screw up leave the sheath walk out too abruptly and i think that it was in that sort of zoned out state he strolls right past somebody, you know, who, who, you know, who knows he may not have even seen, but that the person is there and he just strolls right out. And I think that, that, that also has a quality on a personality level of suggesting somebody who, who likes being the arbiter of who lives and who dies. You know, I'm not interested in you. You're not part of the fantasy. I don't, I'm not afraid that you're going to turn me in, you know, that kind of, that, that arrogance, you know, and that, but, but I think he was blipping i really do and um and but i want to emphasize that that's not being made up out of whole cloth because he talks about it that was something he dealt with for a long time and and based on his own self description he is a dissociator and uh, and so so i think we want to kind of put that into the crime scene and I, yeah i think it's really interesting yeah well and it's interesting that in the affidavit you know the eyewitness is in a frozen state the frozen state quote unquote right. and yet and here you're saying because of the way things were going for him he was almost like in a you know a, a blanked out type of problem here as well do you do you think he was anticipating i mean do you do you do you have an opinion one way or the other in relationship to is it a single target? Uh, is it, it did he go? Does he go in there for multiple, or do you believe, like I do, that yeah, this just kind of got out of control? And right. you know, am, am I would I be accurate to say something like that? Do you yes, believe? Yeah. this is like a like a scientist that is, you know, has created a, a a prototype or something of a device and is absolutely completely convinced that it has been so studied that it's going to go perfectly. And then it like blows up when you turn it on or something, right? And he's probably going, what? Like, no, 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 no. Now I've got to assert control. And he would become furious. You have to you have to imagine this is the kind of person that like, if you corrected him, would probably snap at you or condescend to you. He didn't he probably wouldn't like not being the master of the room, right? So imagine the blow you're going in there to assert dominance and control and you don't have any it doesn't nothing goes as planned your surveillance techniques all went up in smoke you would become enraged right completely furious and i think that that is manifested 
in the ferocity of these killings, the passion, the intensity of them, the overkill. I mean, the people who saw the crime scene were like never the same, probably, right? I mean, you've seen the photos, blood coming through the, 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 the panels and so forth. So that I think we have to understand that why somebody like this would be so furious and and we we want to say oh it was you know it, it's a reflection of how sexually aroused he was by that particular victim i think it's an expression of how upset he would have been that he lost control do you do you have a correlation to somebody that you're familiar with that would kind of fit into you know that makeup of how you're describing Koberger you meaning mean another offender yeah another offender that would have kind of gone ballistic because he lost control yeah well, and then uh, that you could correlate the two of them together well, I, I think the, the most classic example of an offender that was like that is dennis rader uh, oh, okay. i mean dennis rader who of course was someone uh, with whom Koberger would be familiar uh and uh and and i think that you know uh, Remember, with Dennis Rader, you had the classic person who was attracted to rote mechanical tasks and jobs and identities and uniforms and everything else and lived like a machine, you know. And then if you pushed him or he was out of control, could turn into a demon. I mean, he was just nasty. And, and, and you know, and uh, so that what, you, what you're envisioning is a person that if he went into a, a house that he had been obsessively watching and things didn't go as planned, you would expect a particularly frenzied, brutal kind of thing to happen. And um, you, you remember, Chris, that I think it was the victim, Bright, uh, that the brother mm -hmm. there, and he's the only one who gets stabbed, for example, yeah. instead of, you know. He but, shoots him. Too. Yeah, because it's like an overkill because you're out of control. And there's a male there, and you might be afraid, and the whole thing. And, um, you know, so so that, and then there's this other thing that comes up with, with BTK for me that I also think about with, with the Koberger case is that there's something very unique about the psychology of a person who targets a group because number one, it's very egotistical. It's the idea that you could go into a three-story house and, you know, and take care of anybody that was in it. I and mean, it's kind of grandiose, right? That, that's first and foremost. But, but secondly, the symbolism of it is that these people are like a family and and that it's not enough to level the playing field that you have to get rid of the the object of obsession that you feel rejects you or that you want to control but but also the people that love them and the the people around because that's what you've been deprived of in your mind you know the the family the belonging the you know and um so that that that's another deeply disturbing aspect of people who go into homes and invade them is it's almost like you're punishing a bunch of people for having a belonging, a place where they belong. And um, and and I think to get into the mind of whoever committed these offenses, it's a mixture of kind of weird uh, desire to express domination control through quasi-sexual uh, kind of aggression and control, but also, a, a, I think, a terrible jealousy of people that are loved and that are attractive and are wanted. And, um, and I, when people ask about the motive, my hypothesis is that it's a mixture. It, it's on the one hand, a desire to express domination control for, for psychosexual reasons. On the second hand, I think, secondly, I think it's about um, being a kind of scientifically minded person who is bizarrely curious about killing and what it would feel like. There are many killers like that. 50% of serial killers, for example, have that motivation, it's estimated. Uh, and then uh, the, the, I think thirdly, it's an expression of jealousy towards those who are loved. And, um, you know, so, so so that's, you know, I always say, Chris, when a, a patient comes to see me, you know, in, in psychotherapy, or I'm evaluating somebody, I always say, I've come to believe that the world could really, every person in the world could really be divided up into one of three buckets. Those who have been loved and the love lasted, those who have been loved and lost it, and those who never were. And the, all three of those people have very different type of psychology. And I have to tell you, I'm a little confused about which one of those Koberger is. 
I think he's the type that was loved at home, but then found that the rest of the world didn't think he was as spectacular as they thought he was. <laughs> you know, so it's like a disappointment. Interesting. You know? Right. That's very different than being somebody that people at home told you were an idiot, and then you go out in the world and they think you're an idiot too. This is more right. like when you're in the house. I have that every single day, by the way, just to, uh, I to make it feel so. better. <laughs> I, I don't think so. But, but you know, you, you want to, it's very important to think about that. But but it's coming up in the chat that people are emphasizing that we shouldn't minimize the degree to which there probably was sexual excitement. And I think that that's like a given. Because remember, it's the most likely motivation in a fantasy-oriented offense, right? That there's a quasi-sexual component. And Chris, you and I have said. Yeah, we've talked about it. of info. I mean, come yeah. on. How much of that is going to be? perverse pornography images yeah. of these people it's going to be bad and listen i don't want to get into the, the the gross but the fact is maybe I'm, post incident yeah I'm, I'm gonna guess that uh this is somebody who was probably yeah we don't have to go there right. i know where you're going Doc. Yeah, where i'm going it was probably around <laughs> Uh, yeah. by the, right, exactly. I, yeah. I want to take you back to uh, the rest of your answer here yeah. on Court TV for the audience. And by the way, if you're just joining with us, Dr. Bricado uh, is here this evening. Uh, he is the author of this great book right behind me, The New Evil, Understand the Emergence of Modern Violent Behavior. If you're in the uh, Manhattan, New York area, uh, you can look him up for, uh, he takes patients, uh, and, um, but you know, don't send him stuff from YouTube that's just off the wall, okay? Please don't bother his office in relationship to that because there can be some of that. Uh, I'm, you know, very familiar with it. But let's go back to Court TV. I want to, I want folks to hear the rest of your answer. Uh, and then um, there's another segment of this. And then I want to get into Gilgo Beach. Extremely adrenaline-soaked emotional experience, uh, and uh, he probably was dissociating a little bit, hence some of the, the mistakes that were made. It's also possible with this kind of an individual, if, again, if he's guilty, um, that there may have also been some quality of enjoying being the arbiter of uh, who it is that lives and who dies. Because remember, with, the, with this type of offender, there is a little bit of a god godlike uh, striving uh, where you feel that you have the power over things like that. Uh, but I suspect it was about dissociation. Joseph Scott Morgan. Okay, so let me uh, jump forward we're, here. Uh, we're learning now. Mm -hmm. uh, Kaylee's parents were describing the room. They um, bedeviled him by being... Well, certainly uh, there are a lot of different... Uh, moment, you think, that he's made that decision, it's go time? Yeah, probably so. Adrenaline explains a lot of things in those kind of situations. Layout of that room. I think one of the edges of planning an attack, matter of fact, all the way to yeah, the, the idea yeah. was that the, the, the day that had been, the evening that had been paid. Yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Looking for the part about the car stop or the part about the, about the, was this pre planned? The pre planned. This one, this, oh, this is it. A couple of blips before this uh, to. Uh, okay to go in to commit this would have been like d-day it would have been a day that was planned plotted out methodically imagined fantasized about very intensely uh, and the idea would be to go in and cherish it so much that there would probably even be trophies kept the way that we would keep a memento from an important day in our lives uh, this is the day uh, that this individual i think finally played out a long-standing fantasy of um, sort of taking out what he had wanted to do uh, toward probably one individual. Uh, and I think the other people, unfortunately, either um, bedeviled him by being there unexpectedly or were simply, um, for lack of a better phrase, collateral, um, uh, the collateral damage uh, in, in a situation where there was a targeting of a, probably one particular individual who was the object of intense stalking and fantasy. I will not be surprised if the electronics eventually yield an individual where there was a sexualized undertone to the fantasizing uh, because it's very typical and that this is a person who would have probably even done things like studied TikTok videos to learn where windows were and doors were and the kinds of movements of the individual and where they went and what their habits were so that there's a false intimacy that develops where you actually believe that you know this person and that you you know everything about them and then finally you consume and control them forever by taking their life 
Joseph Scott Morgan. Okay, so uh, break down the car, though. Is just your point on the car uh, when, when when he was stopped. Oh, uh, we can go over that. that. There's a comment on it there if you want to just show it. Do you have it in the video? Um, I don't think I clipped that. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, you mean you 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 just have pieces of it that are? Yeah, related. yeah. I'm sorry, Gary. I missed that. So the I think what you're talking about is the is the traffic stop that one of the traffic stops that came when he was with his dad driving home after the the alleged crime, right? Correct. And what Vinny Politan talks about um, in in that sequence there is he says. That he was he was always interested that in that moment when the officer asks where they're going, that the answer that Kohlberger gives is sort of odd. He says like oh. that they wanted to try it was something like they wanted to try the Thai food or Thai something. food. And Vinny says, Well, isn't you know, there's gotta be better Thai food elsewhere in the country? Like, why why you can oh, go Indiana or wherever they were not Indiana, I forgot what state it was. Uh that that said, why there? Like it was like a peculiar place to say, you know. And he asks me about it. And so I say, number one, that if that strikes you as odd, it wouldn't really be that surprising because this is the kind of person who I think if he's guilty, if he did this, the kind of person who lacks the empathy and the interpersonal imagination to feel that you're going to think that story is a little weird, right? Because it's like of all the things you could say, it's also a little TMI. You know, it's like when you're an obsessional person gives meticulous detail that isn't necessary you know that kind of thing it's like a when um on um all in the family when archie would say tell me about the movie and um uh, edith would say it all started when the lion roared you know like all right like we don't need to, like, that's just that's just the thing that says it's an mgm movie i don't care like get to the point so it's like a little too much info you know it's probably not what they wanted to know but but anyway, but then the other thing that it that it sort of it's what's what I find fascinating about it, and that's why I wish we had the footage, is I was explaining that a person who has a more average psychology, who has committed an offense, and one in which they would be completely soaked with blood. I mean, four people's blood, right? Horrible. What would happen to that person almost certainly is that they would have a conscience that would nag at them. And if a cop came to talk to them or somebody rang the doorbell or something, they would get jittery and afraid and they would act suspicious. You know, Chris, you've questioned people who <laughs> you could tell something. Is wrong. They would get nervous. They would talk fast. They would, you know, their pupils would look strange that, you know, and their body language would suggest agitation. What's bizarre, creepy to me is, is that if this guy is guilty in that video, he is robust robotically calm totally calm it's oh yes officer I, I, like as if you know oh this is just about stopping a lovely innocent person on the way to get some time right. 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 oh no problem officer here you go whatever and so that he's even turning off the condescending thing too right he's just being totally kind of calm and collected and that is not consistent with a person who would have a the fear reaction or the the the, the kind of um uh, loss of control that would be likely in a person who had an, a normal conscience right and um so no this is speculation of course but if he is guilty that film is disturbing do, do you understand uh, the, the, did you ever see it you ever yeah watched it? i've watched it like, cool as a cucumber yeah Absolutely calm and um, I mean, the first thought I would have if I were the culprit is I'd be thinking, are they pulling me over on purpose because they know what I did? By the second stop, I'd be I'd be nervous. Yes, it is true what the person says. The father looks a little different, a little more normal in how you would react. Right. But but, it, you know, in terms of why is this cop pulling me over? But but the kid, the, the guy doesn't, the Cobra doesn't. So that that I think, especially by the second time, you'd be thinking. Is this a trap? Do they know something? Have they been following me? So, so I mean, wouldn't you say, Chris, it, there's a mismatch between the yeah, way he doesn't, miss a, he doesn't miss a beat doesn't miss at a beat. all. And, and he's like, 
hey, we're just going for Thai food. And dad's like, yeah, well, actually, we're going to Pennsylvania. And it's like, you know, <laughs> and he's like, you and if you look at his eyes, when he looks at his dad, like, you know, you're not going with the program here. You know, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think of this question? Can the I I, I think they can. Absolutely. I mean, it's like sort of a circumstantial thing. I, I, I think that it's going to be very interesting to see who psychologically is examining him. Maybe a prominent person. It may be somebody, you know, that becomes well known. Maybe um, well, they can't call you, can they? <laughs> I don't think so because I've talked about the case publicly and and also because I'm I'm in New York and I think they're probably going to want they, they may go with outside experts, but they may want an Idaho based uh, 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 expert. What but, do you think of that question from Michelle? He, do you think he replays the act in his head every day? If this is the if, if this is the guilty party, it would let's put it this way: I it would be quite an anomaly if he didn't. Uh, that is what these people do. I mean, the, you know, the whole idea is that it's cherished. Uh, you know, it's a it's romanticized. It's it's your happy place that you. I mean, isn't that disturbing? But it's like your happy place that you're going to in your mind. There have been offenders that have told me that when they're sort of splitting, you know, um, compartmentalizing and they're out, you know, being the normal part of the self, right? You know, playing with a kid, you know, hang, going on a date, being with friends or whatever, that they're sitting there talking and laughing and gesticulating the whole thing. And as they're looking at you, they're remembering killing someone. There, there, There is a scene in um, Red Dragon, the uh, Thomas Harris book that was part of the Silence of the Lamb series. Mm. And um, in this scene, the tooth fairy, who is a serial killer, is dating a blind woman. And while the blind woman is with him in his house, being affectionate with him, he's watching film footage of future victims. People, people uh, where he's using the tapes to case their house. He's using tapes that people have mailed in to have um, put onto like VHS tape or whatever. And um, he's watching the footage and that's how he knows the inside of the house and where the locks are and the doors and the whole thing. And he's casing the joint while this blind woman is being affectionate with him, laying on him and so forth. That's what you have to picture. A person who's being amused that run to your nose, they're thinking about that, you know? And um, probably even in the courtroom, people like this think about it. You... Really you kicked up a thought here by saying what you just said. The remember we were talking about because he had a narcotics problem in the past. I mean, yeah. a pretty have a pretty extensive. Yeah, so, I mean, you yeah. you just don't go to heroin by accident. I mean, it it takes a little while to build right. your tolerance to, and to get there. Gateway drug. Mm -hmm. And there's been a you know a lot of stuff, and this is all stuff that we've all read going around that you know the house. The delay for the for the nine one one call was because maybe they were removing drugs or whatever the problem would be. Uh, I mean, that's anything's possible, guys and gals out there. Anything is possible, but uh, if he had a narcotics problem in the past and that house had some connection to narcotics, this is not a cartel hit. The, the I'm I'm going to tell you that right now. Trust me, uh, I can. I can tell you I have worked narco you know cartel hits and this is not one of them. Uh I I just know that for a fact. Uh, but that's just my opinion. I could be a thousand percent wrong, but it is my opinion. This is you know a situation that we've been you know diving into here a lot. But that said, he could have used that as a ruse to somehow get into that home at some point. You know, early on, even before all these crimes had gone down, that he could have, you know, pulled it off of, you know, just hanging out at the parties or something to that effect. Well, I do think that that, um, you know, like when you know, Chris, that when we look at a case, we think of victimology. Yeah. And I think that part of victimology that people don't do enough is to conceptualize the house as part of the victimology. Right. I mean, it's like a sort of like Kaylee Gonzalez's father said, the house is like a victim. And now the house is gone, right? So the, the 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 house has vulnerabilities that are taken advantage of, and it is certainly true that that house was 
known. It was sort of open. It was people were in it all a lot. It's a party play. And what a person of the type who committed this offense would do is they would take the invisibility that they so loathed that people had projected onto them and they would use it as a weapon. And they would say, oh, I'm invisible, huh? Well, then I'm going to use it against you. I'm going to slip in under your nose and, you know. And um, my guess is, is that either he was in that house before, one way or another, physically or virtually. But he knew that house. I am convinced he knew that house. And um, and wouldn't you say, Chris, I mean, the signs yeah. suggest it. Uh, you know, he was confident enough to go in there, three-story house. He was confident. It was dark, you know, whatever. He knew where he was going. He knew precisely where to go. And and, and I think that that um, we don't know if he went in there and just peeked around. We don't know if he took anything as a, as a trophy or whatever. We don't know if he planted some kind of device to listen or look. I mean, now the house is destroyed, so we can't go looking in the looks of grannies. But there may have been some way that that happened. We just don't know. We don't know if he manipulated the Wi-Fi, right? Um, but but I think that there was some process of surveillance, and I think he was in there before. The the kind of offender who did this is more serial killer like than mass murderer like. And um, people who commit this kind of offense, it's like a fledgling thing that they intend to perfect over time. That's why you know the number of serial killers is declining. Some people think it's because they're getting caught quickly. Um, but I think it was supposed to be a one person murder, like a fledgling murder and what might've been a series over time. And it got botched and turned into a mass murder. Mm -hmm. And that's why you wind up with some offenders like BTK that their first murder is a mass murder, but they're actually a serial killer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm for the, for the audience here, I agree with you a thousand percent. I'm going to bring uh, some receipts on what I just said. Uh, just for for clarity of focus, uh, this is uh, that's that's me back in the day. I love that. Uh, and this is uh, Oceanside gangsters may have been made ties to cartels, and this was during the um, uh, Ariano Felix days, early '90s, late '80s, early '90s. They whacked a cardinal, a cardinal uh, in Tijuana. Uh, in fact, they ended up killing our gangbangers uh, out of our area uh, who were the shooters uh, of the Cardinal. So I am very familiar with cartels and how that stuff all works. And I know there's a lot of um, information out there, you know, about this as a cartel hit. Well, you know, I, I, I this isn't my first rodeo and I would be the first one to tell you, hey, this thing looks just like a cartel hit, but unfortunately it doesn't. So that said, this question here, what do you think about the online sleuths who think he's innocent? This is one of these questions I, I wish I could evade, but, I, but I'll say this. We can. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that, um, first of all, people are entitled to their opinion. Right. But the problem is, is that sometimes evidence has to be totally denied in order to come to, to a certain conclusion. There is some evidence that is would be pretty difficult to explain away, like a one in a trillion DNA profile. I mean, I'm not really sure what explanation you would come up with, but but sometimes you have to pause and, and think to yourself, what machinations am I going through to create the picture that this is an innocent person? And he could be, who knows? But you'd have to be like if you think of like Occam's razor, like the means by which the person would be innocent would be so ex ex over the top to explain it that probably the simpler things true. Right? It's just it would be too elaborate of a. And what I'm more interested in is the psychological phenomenon of how a kind of a person who has this manipulative puppet master quality would actually manage from a jail cell to have minions that are going out, declaring innocence, arguing, believing this story as if a Svengali has waved a, a magic finger in front of them. Remember, Svengali, Svengali. And, and they're just, remember, and so you just kind of have this, this 
this image in my mind of people who are infatuated and want to believe something and are you know and um but but i but but it requires not seeing with the senses not seeing things that are very difficult to get around and um and so that i think we get caught up in all this oh this little thing is going to blow this case up oh he's going to get away with it oh i have found that in certain types of offenders particularly narcissistic and sociopathic people that when they get in trouble legally we fantasize that they're going to get away with it first thought we think is ah i know they found that person guilty. they're never going to serve a day i know there was that that big they, there was that windfall for the victim but they're not going to ever have to pay one penny of it because we fantasize that the person is so powerful that they're going to get away with it because that's what they want us to feel it's a manipulation i have seen cases for example where you'll have a person on trial who was abused in youth and is now um a horrible person is a killer right and they will manage in their in their split in their fragmentation they will actually get the jury to split where part of the jury will say they're a victim and the other half will say they're a monster but it's both in other words a person can be attractive and interesting and also a homicidal person there there is nothing to make that you know so that that what i think is you've got this weird cognitive dissonance thing that goes on where some people go my feeling is that this attractive fascinating person you know is you know they're on my mind all the time i really like them therefore they must be good no that is not true you could simultaneously be fascinated by somebody who should be horrifying you and um so that that is interesting to me and then of course you have all the people that are hyperstaphilix there are people who defend this person because they are infatuated and uh, and that infatuation i think is another result of that kind of character structure we want people venerating you and thinking you're gorgeous and all of that so that that i think it's all about pulling strings and and i i wish that some of the people out there who are acting that way would say wow i'm a puppet i'm a marionette uh, being a puppet and and i also think that um in addition there are some people that just like to be contrarian there are some people if you say the sky's blue will argue with you i i just had that happen to me i i i, I was saying to somebody i'm waiting for the bus well which bus are you waiting for you know the blue and white one it's not blue and white it's azure and egg crew i said are you kidding me and they said that just to have an argument with me so I said, okay, we'll say Azure and Aqua, but blue and white. So what about muddy paws? Dr. Gary, can you explain from a psychological perspective uh, what would cause a witness to freeze for several hours? And she's talking about obviously the one of the two girls. I, I think that I have a problem with speculating about the two female victims that are alive, the two people in the house that were alive, because I think that there's always going to be a little bit of blaming in in the way that you interpret and i have heard every story you can imagine in the press and in the you know the podcast i'm sure you have too of what may have happened there you know were they hiding something was that you know whatever were they just scared were they whatever but i think that we have to remember that they could have had the bejesus scared out of them it's entirely possible that this was an emotional reaction to blood and gore all over the place you know and just being afraid i don't know but but i think that 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 is one of those questions that hangs over this case and i want to know but i really don't want to see those people badgered i'm a little worried that the defense is going to badger them and try to blow up the story that the one witness you know gave because the idea would be maybe we can get rid of the grounds for the warrant to go into the house if we could poke a hole but i'm a little worried about hurting a person who was probably terrified and um so i, th I think they're going to have to be sensitive to that i'm not really sure you know but uh, uh, uh how that's going to go but but don't you think chris i mean I, I think we have to be careful about speculating because have you've seen the behavior of people who are victimized or who yes. it's, crimes a, it's, a, it's right. a delicate walk sometimes you have to take days 
to let them to let them calm down and then then approach them you know you what we used to do is tell them up front hey here's a piece of paper here's a pen take your time please try to document the most you know important thoughts that are that are in your mind right now you know put them on paper and then uh, in a couple hours we'll come talk about it what about this one do you think this is his first time um let's remember that the Idaho murders constituted a mass murder. I, everyone knows that uh, we've told them a million times that I and Dr. Bragi Gurgis created the Columbia mass murder database, largest study ever done of mass murder. And we can tell you based on statistics that 11.78% of mass murderers have either killed once before or go on to kill with the cooling off period before or after making them serial killers. So that rare, about 11.78% of mass murderers are serial killers where the mass murderer is either the first offense, like BTK, or the the uh, they go on to, to kill a single individual. And, um, or they go on to commit mass murder after having killed a single individual. In this case, I strongly suspect that this was the first offense, but I do not believe it would have been the last offense in whoever did this. I am convinced based on the facts and the psychological profile and many, many, many previous offenders in that I have examined uh, either a case I'm involved in or consulted on or an infamous case in the papers or whatever books I've read, et cetera, about offenders. I am aware of many hundreds of cases in my records, uh, other people's cases, and their patterns are pretty clear. The, these are the patterns consistent with a person who who um, looked a lot more like a serial killer, and um, and I think probably a sexually and ego motivated serial killer. And what you can what you can divine is is that this is a person who would have wanted to get it more right the next time, um, would have become fixated on a new person, trolled for a new person, and then gone and 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 committed an offense again. And um, and I think probably did not think it was going to be the end of the road uh you know probably still doesn't probably thinks i'm going to get out uh but 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 i think that that the reason this is such an important point is because um i i think i've told the story on here before um i was on a program once with a lawyer talking about this case and i was explaining the potential motive and the attorney who you know well, i don't know want to speculate about why they felt the need to say it sort of interrupted me, I think, and said, the motive doesn't matter. You know, the motive doesn't matter. Just the facts, you know, whatever. And I wanted to say, but I didn't get a chance to say it. I wanted to say the motive is of extreme importance because if the jury is faced with the possibility of letting such a person out, they have to know that the, the psychology and, and, precedent by similar people suggests that they would be at risk of offending again and the jury needs to understand they would have to understand that 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 has mm -hmm. to be in the back of their mind this is not a what you know i've heard some people call a one and done situation most mass murderers are but i think this was a this is part of a sequence uh, somebody that would have i think had a sequence yeah and i think that's important you've pointed out you know, a while ago about the sequence here. I mean, I, I think we, I think folks have it backwards. You know, they're saying he's a serial killer when in fact he's a mass murderer, you know, to your an accused point. mass murderer, yes. Yep. Accused mass murderer to your point, that would evolve evolved into right. a, a serial killer. But it was and, supposed to be, I think it was supposed to be mm -hmm. the first single murder in what would have been a series oh interesting but it everything did not go as planned and turned into a mass murder because so what, what i think you have is mixed motives because remember we talked about all those motives those were the motives for the target mm -hmm. but then you've got simple elimination murder for the other three they're simply witnesses they're in yeah. the way right. they were not the focus and um and so that i think that's i strongly suspect that once you understand that then this was a person motivated in the way as the the, the serial killer would be motivated. and i think it's important for people to understand you actually coined that term in forensic psychology elimination murder I, I, so, I, 
Right. You know, there's a there's a lot of thought process that went behind that one. I want to answer this one. Uh, can the prosecution uh, can they use the TR? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, you know, press play. Uh, I, I think he watches them. The, uh, yeah, I, I know. But yes, the answer is yes, they can. Uh, they absolutely can, if and so can the defense. So that's always something to always remember when we're up here on these panels on social media. This is about real victims, real people. And it's sometimes it's a delicate art. It may not go well with, you know, some people that are just, you know, heck bent on causing problems with opinions. But if there's something here that the prosecution sees and they, they can, they can definitely subpoena all of this stuff and it can go to them 100%. Right. But, um, but I think Chris, that, that we shouldn't glaze it. We shouldn't uh, uh, gloss over the idea that this offender almost certainly before arrest was watching this program, knew the profile that was created that you created commented, mm -hmm. may very well have commented. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in addition, if they have access to something like an iPad or whatever, almost certainly watches. And, and I think that it would be very interesting, you know, that if I one day got a letter or something for, you know, let's say there's a conviction, I wouldn't be surprised if, if I got a letter saying, here's what you were wrong about, here's yeah. what you were right about, you know, are you interested in telling my story? You know, I always wanted my story told, you know, uh, uh, can you be the the Dr. Ramsland to my BTK, you know, and and kind of come and talk to me? You know, I, I think that this is a person who ultimately, in a, the most pathetic way, wants to be seen. I mean, I think that's the whole point. And um, and so I think it, when this whole story is over, uh, if he is guilty, he will, I'm sure, start to tell the story because he wants to be an object of fascination and um but that would of course first you make an attempt at defense if he's innocent you know he's innocent if he's whatever you know but but if he's guilty i you can bet it's just a matter of time until he would reach out to someone to tell the hey, story yeah. the letter, uh, dennis raider letter oh I, I i showed it already last hey, time did you get a christmas card too from susan smith i did indeed yes i have a you, I have you a, don't have that nearby do you that's, I, I mean, it's like I'd have to go into the closet and get it out. But I, I, I have all kinds of weird things from people who's, you know, Chris, this show has inspired a lot of people to contact me. I get very peculiar things from people, emails and, and messages. But you would be shocked how many offenders watch this show. People, for example, who did time and now are out or are in prison and can somehow watch. And they'll say, I feel like you get me. And I want to tell you about me, right? I feel like what you're saying is just so on target for me. And they always say the same thing, you know, um, you can use this information to help people, but it's really, you know, I want, them. I want you to really be interested in me. Um, but, but, but I get those kind of messages and, 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 um, you know, it's, it, they're, they're just, it's always deeply pathetic, you know? Well, um uh chris what 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 shall we talk about next gilgo uh yeah so let's shift gears real fast we've got oh, just some... are they exhausted after two hours they could still no we got an hour it was two hours so we can go through this stuff in probably sure. 15 20 minutes here i'm okay, okay. it's up to you are, are you good, I'm like an you good? Money. first sunday night okay uh everybody else okay over there in the chat uh, we appreciate you guys so much. I think they're they're hooked. They could sit here all night. They're, they're, they're they don't ever want to leave. You know. Well, we love them. That's for sure. And uh, we appreciate you coming in. So, so there are there is some news coming out. Number one, you're going to be with John Ray uh, at the big event in Manhattan on the thirtieth. No, at, at St. John's uh, University in Queens on the thirtieth. Okay. They moved it. That's why they moved it to to Marillac Hall and St. John's University, and um, it's a press event where we're going to get some new info from John Ray, and and I'm delighted. I you know I wrote to the office and asked if I could attend, and, and of course they you know I'll, uh, it's going to be extremely interesting. 
but but Chris, um, I'm sure you saw, although. Yeah, I, I was just re reacting to the chat. Everybody's in. Oh. We're like, we're, we got, and thank you to our folks uh, over in the over the Atlantic. Uh, we love you in England and Australia. I mean, you guys are up late, and you know, feel free to come back in the morning if you need get some some shut eye. But uh, okay, so let's talk about you know a very interesting twist here, uh, and they found hair. Um, that belongs, they've connected it back to Rex's daughter. On Amber Costello. On, On Amber Costello. Costello. Yeah. So that, mm -hmm, go ahead. I was going to say, it's fascinating. Yeah, and there's a chart that, well, well, first of all, this leads a whole bunch of open questions now, right? It just opens another can of worms. Exactly. Uh, because now the 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 questions come. Okay, wait a minute. How does this hair? You've got the wife's hair, and now you've got the daughter's hair. You've got the belt on a variety of you know the victims, and now you've got this hair from both mom and dad, or excuse me, mom and daughter. And that that raises a lot of questions about how this thing. Uh, it goes down, and this this chart, by the way, comes from. Uh, Going to give a shout out and credit to. Hang on for a minute. I hope I pronounce her name right. Lisa Ribakoff, R I B A C O F F. Lisa, thank you for putting this out into the environment under fair use. We're grateful, but. So we've got the victim, uh, female hair, uh, the Maureen, then Megan, two female hairs, Megan Waters, second of two female hairs. Okay, so they, they broke it up into, she broke it up into two, three, actually. She broke it up into three columns there. This is the first time I'm looking at this in depth, by the way. So there's Do one have, hair on Maureen, three on Megan, and one on Amber. Okay. Yeah. And what what give give me the gist of what this chart uh, and what this was coming to you? What information did you well, have on it? If you look at this carefully, it's really quite fascinating because what it's basically telling us is the location of each hair, precisely where it was, and then when it was examined by in different ways in terms of DNA. They were able to pretty much determine who the hair probably came from. And what you wind up realizing is a couple of things. First of all, there are hairs. There, there is a hair that, that they think is could be from Victoria, the daughter. And then you have the hair of the, the, um, the excuse me, it looks like there, are, that, that there, there, there were multiple hairs that came from the wife. But it looks like there's this one on, on Amber Costello that they think comes from the daughter. And then you just have the one that comes from Rex. And then you look at the location. And what's fascinating is you see that in the case of Maureen, it says that it was on the buckle, the restraint, right? In the case of Megan, one is outside the head area. One is on the tape in the head area. And one is in, is in the bottom portion of the burlap and the part that's in the burlap is the one that comes from Rex, that they think comes from Rex. That's extremely interesting. And then with Amber, it's also in, near the head. So you start thinking, hmm, the only hair that's inside the bag where the victim goes is from Rex. They think comes from Rex. The other hairs all seem to be in the areas of restraints or the head, which are in other words, it almost seems to suggest that when tape is being wrapped or the person is just sort of sitting in the house or the car or whatever, they may be picking up ambient hair from multiple family members that are in that place. Because otherwise, what are we supposed to think? That the child was involved in the sexual offense? I mean, this is ridiculous. It's far more probable that the hair was just ambient in the environment in which the offense occurred and that tape was being applied and all that, right? So then you start picturing, well, where could they be then? And from the beginning, if you go back and watch the very first videos, 
you and I, Chris, had said that probably they were lured into a car and taken home what, because the wife was away, supposedly, right? Or mm -hmm. in some other area, right? Because with organized offenders, that's what you would do. You would isolate them. We also know, Chris, that based on other offenders, that you would lure them, but then you'd have to blitz them somehow, either drug them or hit them over the head or shock them. And so you make them comfortable and then you, so that what you picture is either they're in the car or they're in the house where there are the hairs around from these other people. And then there's some kind of blitz attack and then they're sort of bound. I personally think the binding was anti-mortem. I think the binding was part of the sexual thrill. And I think the tape was just picking up hair because it was probably in the house or the car. Uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, and I think that that originally when we were just thinking it was the wife's hair and his, there was this whole idea that maybe the wife was involved in something, you know, and I had said from the start, you remember, I, in fact, I thought I was going to be wrong about it. I had said I thought that maybe the wife just was out of the house or maybe she was involved in some of the sexual stuff, but not the killing, you know, if that's what happened. And um, so now I think it's starting to make more sense that it was probably just ambient hair in wherever he was doing this. It's also interesting that their hair is not in the burlap because that's not an ambient place where they ever were, right? So just his. So Chris, what do you think about that hypothesis that it was just picked up from the house or the car, the truck? I like the idea that, you know, because he was very methodical in terms of, you know, his victimology, right? Who we would pick up. I mean, we all know that yeah. it's obvious women that were working in the evening. And so mm -hmm. he would lure them to the house. I, I agree with you. I think he would have gotten them into the house. And this is just speculation right now. But the most likely spot that he would have utilized is, you know, make them feel comfortable, get them into, a, you right. know, on a couch or something to that effect where you could get a cross contamination, such yeah, as head, a head 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 against something that people sit on or right. Yep. Exactly. And then, you know, but I also agree with your hypothesis that now it's a blitzkrieg with the tape, with all the binding, with all the torture, all that that comes in pretty rapidly. It would draw and, or hit or choke. Or yeah. Whatever. Right. And which is interesting because remember the gal who ran, right? And, you know, she's saying that, you know, she says they, but she also says he. Right. So there's a combination there that, you know, she's she's running for her life, which would go towards this blitzkrieg type of, you know, attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think, you know, I don't think we know enough just yet, the no. totality of that, but... Is it going to surprise you uh, when you're with John uh, this week that you were, you're going to hear additional information about potentially even more? Uh, I, you know, at all. I, I think what is almost certainly going to happen, although I, I can't predict, but I, I probably is going to say that there have been additional witnesses who are creating a picture of, a, of an even wider net of potential uh, people involved, people, victims, so forth. Now, I have to say, Chris, right now the jury is out on whether there is some involvement of other people, some involvement of the wife, some, I don't know. I only know that now that the daughter's hair is there, it starts leaning a little bit more toward that that hair could just be from inside the house. Or something. Because, because if you're going to use the finding of her hair on a victim to accuse her, then by implication, the daughter's hair being there takes on a whole disturbing implication, uh, a meaning that I just don't think makes much sense. And uh, so that it, I think we have to presume that it probably was picked up. Remember the woman, one of the women who we went on a date with that didn't wind up dead. And I think she said that he kept pushing to get into his car and go back to his place. Right. I think that was the MO. I, I really do. I think that was the MO. And I think that Nobody was home. The, you know, he probably sometime was, you know, had a reputation for being involved in this kind of sex stuff. Maybe the wife knew, friends knew, whatever. But I don't think people knew about the killing if he was doing that. I think that was the dirty secret, the real secret. And I think that probably the idea was that these people that were, you know, sex workers or whatever would come there. They may have even been there before. They may have heard from other sex workers that 
they went there and nothing happened to them they were safe they were comfortable i mean imagine remember the one of the women who survived said that that she was flown in yeah dinner with him and talk to him and listen to him and and then go home so that that imagine that part of the psychological thrill is i'm going to lure you into the net by making you feel comfortable you know and then all of a sudden I dispatch you, you know, and um, and that's a that's a, reminds me of a technique a hunter would use. Yeah, who was the guy up in Alaska again? I forget. Was it Hanson? Uh, Robert Hanson. Hanson, that's right. He would fly them in and then cut them loose and say, "Run." Yeah, he would take their clothes off and make them run in the forest and hunt them. <coughs> yeah, he was a sick puppy. Alaska's number one uh, in the in the statistics, by the way, for for serial killers. Number f the fifth state is uh, Washington, Washington State, number five. And in which, you know, your question earlier on when we were talking about, you know, BK, well, what, the, what, what drew the, him there? Real right? from, uh, from, uh, okay, well, we're two hours into this show. I think, uh, did you guys have fun tonight? Did everybody have fun? Because Dr. Dr. B gets the... Uh, the, the final word always whenever he's on our show i absolutely just love his wisdom oh, I, don't know what I, would say tonight. <laughs> I if you're new to us if you're new to this channel can you hit that if if everybody here we've got 3400 people here still and in some places it's three o'clock in the morning uh miss sophia is back with us you know show miss sophia some love in the chat here she she's out of the hospital she's with us yay and we're grateful for that. Buddy's at my feet trying to figure out how to do something. I don't know what he's doing. But um, are you ready to go to Hawaii tonight, Gary? And by the way, we've got some other great shows coming. Uh, um, we're reaching out to some really neat people. Uh, we'll have Dr. Ann back. And we'll probably have Victor back. Uh, we've got to get him on here more often. He's not... Uh, People, you guys, love people love them too. The, those two. He did some great stuff. We did some great stuff. It's behind the scenes, but uh, he's got some really interesting research coming uh, that uh, I think people are going to be. Whoa, that's interesting. Uh, and it belong and it in, involves a John Bonet. Uh, we'll we'll let that you we'll let that sit there for a little bit. Um, okay, so you've got the closing word tonight. Thank you always, Gary, for blessing our program uh and when you're done we'll go to hawaii are you good with that yeah although i i'm not really sure what to say as a uh as a final point tonight um <clears throat> i guess i'll just say that um sometimes as we're having these conversations it is very easy to forget um what we're dealing with that these are people human beings who were killed brutally and um instead of you know we sometimes tend to get really interested in the mind of the offender and i think we have to put the emphasis on the victims um it is hard even for us professionals um to to really let it soak in that these are people's you know loved ones and friends and co-workers and so forth i remember um my mentor michael stone uh, who passed recently telling me when I first started to work with him that that he kept a extensive diary of his dreams and I said you know why do you do that and he said well because in order to do this work you have to be so compartmentalized that the real feelings that you have about some of these cases are going to spill out in that way and you want to kind of process them and and you know when they leak out like that and so he encouraged me to record them. And um, I remember, and I was just writing about this for the, the book I'm doing. I remember I had a dream where I visited the home in which I grew up. And I was in one of the bedrooms and I heard a commotion and so forth. And in the darkness, I, I looked over the bed and there was a person that was completely bound up in tape, like a mummy like duct tape and so forth and wriggling. And I pulled the tape away from the person's mouth 
And I said, who are you? And the person said, I'm your mother, I'm your father, I'm your brother, I'm your sister, I'm your granddaughter, you know, and the list went on and on until I woke up. And I always think about that dream because I think what it implied was that on some level that I was sort of putting into the periphery of my vision, um, I understand that these people could easily be the people that I love most, that you love most, or perhaps even one of us. And, um, and so I think it's important to put that into perspective, to pause a minute and think that there are people out there who have twisted psychologies where they feel entitled to reach into the world and pluck out for their own fantasy enactment a person simply because that person has a certain appearance, is attractive, is upsetting to them psychologically, whatever. And they feel entitled to just take that person out of the world, to dispatch them. And um, that entitlement and that is one of the most horrifying aspects of some of these cases because it makes you understand, and this is particularly true of the targeting that happens to women, I think way more than men, is that you have to walk around with the idea that there could be people looking at you targeting you studying you wanting you etc and you're evoking these emotions in them you don't even know you're evoking and they become angry you know randomly out of the you know as if you even you know know who they are or care about them because you've become a symbol to somebody with a bizarre psychology or a perverse psychology so i just think we have to pause a minute and think about the construct of victimhood and how you know we never know where that terrible finger is going to fall you know in 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 the world and um to be deeply deeply sensitive because out there there are families who are sitting around thinking could have been anyone and it was my kid you know and um and it is in that vein that people like chris and and i become upset about things that don't seem like much to the ordinary person like tearing down the house where your child lived and died um, but but I think when you've worked with enough victims, um, your heart becomes heavy with that reality. And um, so let's let's think about the victims more than some pathetic offender. Take care. Hard working every day. I'm stressed out. 24-7, babe No, no timeouts Wish we could fly away You and I Go to our favorite place Oh, yeah, yeah Make special memories Together I'll be your company Now and forever I say we fly away You and me Go to our favorite place Facing away Taking away, yeah, we're taking away